which required us when we were aged between 10 and 11 to remember by heart great chunks of scripture. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. That's from Ecclesiastes. I could also do 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount. But the thing which got me most was the Ten Commandments. We had to do them uh, and, and re remember them. Under threat of punishment, there was a thing in Scotland called a belt. It was a strap about three feet long with a tong at the end, which really hurt you when it was administered on your hand. And if we, if we failed to say the right words correctly in the right order, that was one of the threats. What I never thought of was what the commandments really meant. It was important that we learned them by osmosis, I think, they expected us to understand them. And I remember one night thinking, I wonder which one of them will break first. Because <laughs> you know, these are the things you're not supposed to do. So many of them are do not, do not. So I went through them one by one and I decided that the one I was least likely to break was coveting my neighbour's wife because Mrs. Duncan was three times my age and smelled of cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was unlikely to be coveted. But then when I was 11, I moved to a high school where there was a thing called the Scripture Union. Now, I had never met this beast before, but I found that it was an interesting organisation to be part of because if you went at quarter past uh, one to the Scripture Union, you could be in it until two o'clock and miss the first 20 minutes of the first period, which inevitably was physics, a subject in which I did not excel. So I became a very zealous uh, attender at the Scripture Union, singing profoundly theologically sophisticated lyrics such as, I'm H-A-P-P-Y, I'm H-A-P-P-Y, I know I am, I'm sure I am, and B-O-R-E-D. And if you had a perfect attendance for the, the um, winter and, and spring term, then there was an afternoon in which you were taken to somewhere of religious significance. So I had all the cold stars required to get on the bus. And it wasn't to some great uh, birth site of a missionary or a cathedral or some ancient building. It, it was a missionary exhibition in a rather dowdy hall. 12 miles to the south of Kilmarnock, my hometown. And, and there were stalls uh, which inevitably talked about or showed what white people were doing with black people on other sides of the world. Very few people were there of an ethnic origin other than British. And I came across this stall which had a green base piece of cloth in front of it and on it were small red calfskin books which said the New Testament and Psalms. There was no one around, and there was about 12 of these. And in other places, you were encouraged to pick up leaflets. So I put my hand forward to pick one of these up and take it away, when suddenly from behind a curtain came a man who later I discovered was called Mr. Gideon. And he said to me, do you have a, I put it down immediately, do you have a portion of Holy Scripture? I said, no, sir. He said, have we not been at your school to hand out portions of scripture. I said, no, sir, not while I've been there. I've only been there for about four months. Well, he says, picking up one of these little red calfskin books, would you like this? And I put out my hand and said, I, I really would. He said, well, I will give you this on condition that from this day and until you die, you'll read a portion of God's holy word every day. And remember when you make this promise, you're not just making it before me on earth. You're making it before your Father in heaven. And on the day of judgment, you'll be held accountable for whether you keep the promise. So I said yes, and then I became a neurotic. <laughs> Afraid that my granny might die if I didn't read the Bible every day. But I did, I did. And I told nobody. And then when it came in November and my birthday, I discovered to my horror that my mother and one of her forays into my bedroom to try to make order out of chaos had discovered this and thought our John has a religious gene in his system and so she clubbed together with my grandmother to buy me the whole works the King James Bible the one that Jesus used with, <laughs> with, a, with a zip with a zip round it Oxford University Press and instructions as to how to open such a book well I can't say I was deliriously happy but it posed the first theological problem of my life 
Should I continue? I got to Luke's Gospel with this be read book. Should I continue going through Luke's Gospel or should I start at the very beginning, Genesis? And maybe because, you know, the sound of music was out at that time, I thought, let's start at the very beginning. I'd be a good place to start. So I did. And Genesis, you know, I'd heard about Adam and Eve and Exodus, I'd heard about Moses and uh, the Exodus. I'd, I'd seen the Ten Commandments film with my grandmother. And then it came to Leviticus. I'd heard read this thing about if the person should find on himself a yellow spot emitting pus, he shall show himself to the priest who will pronounce him unclean. Now, I'm 12, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hitting the mirror every second morning, I thought, thank God I'm a Calvinist, we don't have priests, so I don't have to show myself to anybody. But that was the beginning of a, of a kind of love-hate relationship with the Bible. The thing was, nobody told me how to read it. Nobody ever told me how to pray. And all through my teenage years, and when I studied uh, theology at university, nobody ever told us how to read the Bible, and nobody ever told us how to pray, although both of these seemed fairly mandatory. So some of what I say might seem a little bit kind of uh, naive, but I think it's worthwhile just mentioning it. We were told that the, that the Bible was, was not one book, it was a library of books. Well, I don't go for that, because if I go into the libraries, there are certain places that I would never look at. Physics, ballet dancing being two of these. But what the Bible does have is a whole range of different genres of literature, like history, philosophy, fiction, letters, poetry, politics, drama, law, biography and textbooks and if you were to go to a corner of a bookshop and today I helped the economy of Liverpool by going into two if you were to go to the corner of a bookshop and saw history or politics or philosophy or drama or poetry and purchased a book you would not read that book in the same way as you read others which did not share the distinctiveness of the genre you know if you if you get a, a technical book you probably demands a great deal of your attention, particularly if it's something like car maintenance, you aren't quite sure that what you're doing is the right thing. If you were to pick a book about philosophy, you would not read it quickly, you might take a while over it and try to measure your thinking with the measured thinking of the person who had written the book. If you pick up a book which is a biography, the chances are that your, or history even, the chances are that your memory will come into play. Because you might know something about a, a, an individual, I think particularly, I knew something about Shostakovich because I loved his music. And when I read the biography, I was beginning to bring my understanding of him and the music which I knew into correspondence with the facts of his life. The same is true of history. And if you uh, read poetry, then poetry more perhaps than any other literature demands both a a kind of concentration that we don't give to fiction and it also requires us to perhaps read it over and over again because poetry gives of itself the more we begin to meditate on the text. And if we pick a book of fitch, fiction then what is required of us then is the gift of our imagination. Two days ago I was doing a seminar and I'll be doing this again on Wednesday, on the gift of the imagination. And one of the things that I ask people to do is to close their eyes and I'll see a sentence like, the old man went along the gravel path up to the black door. He rang the bell and in no time at all, it was answered by a little girl who said to him, who are you? And he said, I am the grandfather you have never met. So I'll ask people to close their eyes while I say that. And then once they've opened their eyes, I'll say, okay, what age was the little girl? And different people will give a different age. What age was the grandfather? Different people will give a different age. Did the black door have a wooden handle or a brass handle? Different people will say different things. What's happening is that the raw details of a story is being given and people add the colouring to the black and white. Fiction demands of us that we give it our imaginative attention. That's why when we go to see a film of a famous book, 
we might come out feeling quite disgusted and think, well, that's not what it says in the book. That's not the book that I read. Well, the reason is that the script writer had to put into maybe two hours a book which took you five or six hours to read, and his or her imagination is different from yours. So when we come to the Bible, the thing about the Bible is that the print is all the same colour and all the same size from beginning to end. If it were to be red when it was poetry and blue when it was prophecy and black when it was history and perhaps gold when it was, you know, wisdom sayings, then we would recognise we're dealing with different kinds of literature and we wouldn't get into a, a, a kind of muddle expecting that when we read Leviticus, our heart will be as strangely warmed as it is when we read John's Gospel. So what I'm going to do is to take four examples of moments in the Bible which have been used to denigrate and to belittle people whose sexual orientation or preference is not heterosexual. And the first is what I think most people will know has been discredited a long while ago. It's to do with sodomy which comes from Sodom and it's a story which is in Genesis which has been used with regard to same-sex male relationships because when Lot gave hospitality to angels for an evening the local <coughs> male inhabitants wanted to have sexual intercourse with them. Well we should know first of all that their intentions were not honourable you know these were not students from a gay society wanting to explore erotic sex with heavenly beings. These were heterosexual men who wanted to humiliate foreigners in a way in which soldiers throughout the ages have. I don't say this as a statement of fact, but I heard it from a professor of New Testament who said that when, at the time of Christ, people were going to be crucified, they were humiliated by soldiers, which in some cases would be that they would be sodomized, they would have intercourse inflicted on them, rape inflicted on them as a means of demoralizing them. And this is not just in ancient Rome, this happens at the present day. It happens in Africa, it happened in Iraq. It's seen as a punishment. And the F word, which I'm not going to say, doesn't always, at least in Glasgow, mean sexual intercourse. It can mean killing and a range of other things which are beyond comprehension. But this story is later alluded to by Jesus and it's not seen by Jesus to have any sexual connotations whatsoever. whatsoever. He speaks of the sin of Sodom as the sin of inhospitality. The people came to a place where Lot had offered them hospitality and people of that village, whether they were nationalists or whether they just hated folk from the outside, felt that what should be visited on these men was not kindness, but cruelty. The second kind of literature, I've moved from the story of the history to the poetry, which will bring us to the title of this uh, seminar. Poetry appeals to the imagination and it also appeals to the emotions. There was a female poet who was on Radio 4 last week. There was, there was National Poetry Day, or maybe two weeks ago, and she was being asked uh, what poetry is. And she said, well, you cannot define poetry, but essentially, poetry speaks of a truth which is deeper than facts. It's not just information that's given to us. It's a way of understanding, or it's an invitation to try to understand the truth which is deeper than the facts. We had a professor in Glasgow of English literature whose, whose definition of poetry was Poetry is these words and only these words. Very concise. He was a Shakespeare expert. And I think we expected something more. But that's what he said. Poetry is these words and only these words. They have been chosen and put in a position for a whole range of reasons in order that those who read them might be drawn into considering, considering the depth which is behind them. And poetry uses a, a variety of devices some of which I remember from my high school, but I could never understand them. Alliteration, simile, metaphor, euphemism, onomatopoeia, and of course, synecdoche, synecdoche and metonym. When W.H. Auden says, stop the clocks, it's not a command. 
When Robert Burns says, my love is like a red, red rose, it's not an anatomical description. If you thought it was an anatomical description, you'd say, poor girl. <laughs> She's got prickles all up and down her spine, and her complexion fades in the autumn. But it's not an anatomical de a a a description at all. When Wordsworth writes, I wandered lowly as a cloud, he's actually telling lies. He was with his sister. But that doesn't matter. The facts don't matter. It's the beauty or the loneliness or the other emotion behind the words which we're called to share. Now, if this is true of poetry, then we have to acknowledge that it will be true of the Psalms. We may not be able to understand alliteration in the Psalms, we may not be able to see the acrostic in the Psalms where the Jewish alphabet, letters A to Z or the equivalent, begin uh, each of the, of the several verses. We might not be able to appreciate the rhyme at the end of some of the poems. We might never see the poems as actually being between two or three, diff two or three different speakers at one time. All of that's missed, partly because of the deplorable way in which the church has sung the Psalms. Roman Catholics, da 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 Anglicans are a bit posher. Pum 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 Calvinists, da 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 No other body of poetry has been so corseted with these three different kinds of ways in which they're articulated and we miss we miss very often the poetry but when we come to the psalms we're dealing with images poetry is full of images last night when i was here i mentioned how uh, to some people's dismay and to some people's delight you come to psalm 23 and you find there are two images of god and to call it the shepherd psalm is only effective for the first three or four verses because right in the middle is a change. And I never noticed this until I was at, working at a, a conference uh, in Anaheim, which is um, near Los Angeles. It was a conference of Christian educators in the Roman Catholic Church. There would be about maybe 12,000 of them there. And the last, well, all the masses were held in this huge Anaheim sports stadium, which is more commonly used for basketball matches. And there's about three or four galleries. So the place was packed every time. And the last mass was very impressive because there was very kind of vibrant uh, music and in came dancers with banners waving all over the audience. And then behind them came the procession of the priests dressed in cream cassocks and uh, purple stoles because it was Lent. And behind them came about five or six bishops with pointy hats and behind them came the Cardinal Archbishop Mahoney. Very impressive. Very impressive too when he began to speak because he spoke in three languages. He spoke in Spanish because half the diocese is Spanish. He spoke in English because half the diocese is English. And then with his fingers he spoke to people who were deaf and dumb. Very impressive. But the moment which, which fascinated me, stunned me, changed me was at the preparation of the gifts when the table is being prepared to receive the bread and the wine. And the table was not one table, it was like six pasting tables side by side in the front of the, the auditorium. And it looked a fairly scrappy affair until two small Mexican women got up with a bundle of cloth and they put it in the middle and the one went one way and the other went another. And in a way which only women could do with great confidence at either end, they billowed the cloth up into the air and they let it fall and they reverenced the table. And then I remember, you have prepared a table for me. This is a far more feminine than masculine image. If we go to Psalm 114, there's lines in Psalm 114 which talk about how the mountains skip like rams and the little hills like lambs. Now, if I'd come here yesterday or whenever, and said, you know, I was in Lancashire recently, and I looked at the hills, and the big ones were skipping like rams, and the little ones, you might ask me what illegal substance I had been ingesting before I'd seen this. But we don't do that, because we afford poetry the ability to say that which is illogical, in order that we might sense truth and beauty behind the illogical words. Psalm 51. 
From my birth I have been evil, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, is this a warrant for the doctrine of original sin? From my birth I have been evil, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, in most experts' opinion, was never written by David. Possibly David wrote none of the Psalms at all. It's quite simply a matter of, well, the comparison would be if you go to Buckingham Palace and you go to the Queen's Gallery, none of the pictures there have been done by Her Majesty. <laughs> They're the Queen's pictures, but he didn't paint them. The Psalms of David are a collection of poems, many of whom were written for David. In the same way as court jesters or court poets or court musicians would provide entertainment or texts for the benefit all over Europe of those who are wealthy and who are in privileged noble positions. So what has happened is that people know that David has not been perhaps the moral mentor that he needed to be, or he should have been. He has already committed adultery with a woman called Bathsheba, and then he engineered to have her husband killed so there'd be no rivalry. And then not long afterwards, he discovers that his daughter, Tamar is being, has been raped by her stepbrother Amnon. And David does not interfere. He doesn't discipline Amnon. He does nothing about it. He stands back. He's been a coward in the, in the Well, how could he discipline his son when his um, adultery has already been rehearsed elsewhere? So the nation needs to know that this king who they honour is really penitent before God. And someday we don't know who. We have no idea of the authorship of the Psalms. But somebody writes a psalm for the king, which will express his penitence to God. And that poem becomes known throughout the community, so that everyone knows these are the words that the king has used, and his credibility begins to be restored. But it uses language which will of necessity be excessive, because it seems as if David is rotten to the core, rotten through and through, and therefore that depth of rottenness has to be somehow or other conveyed, and the words come, from my birth I have been evil, sinful from the moment my mother conceived me. But this pristine piece of poetry has been used throughout the ages to cast a negative shadow on sexual relations and has led to innocent people being demonised. The notion that either we are sinful from the womb or that an abnormality in health or temperament or a minority sexual orientation is evil is something which Jesus does not condone. Indeed, he attacks it. I mentioned when I was preaching last night that, that for me the great moment when that becomes apparent is when he heals a man born blind. And he has to deal first of all with his disciples who are with him when they and Jesus see the man and the question that the disciples ask is, well, who sinned? His parents or the man? They presume that his infirmity has been caused by, by sin. And later on, towards the end, he has to deal with the Pharisees, who have told the man that he was conceived in sin, and have told his parents that their son was a no user. And Jesus has to take this on, and he makes it quite clear. <coughs> That if there's sinfulness abounding, it's in those who are making a false accusation against someone who is totally innocent of what they accuse him of. You cannot take a piece of figurative poetry and turn it into a statement of genetic fact. And if the doctrine of original sin is in any way based or encouraged by Psalm 51, then that encouragement has to be dismissed. It's a poem and not a piece of genetic information. But I want also to deal with legal ordinances because I don't believe that people in the 21st century should feel obliged to obey a law or inflict a punishment for its breach out of context. Leviticus 18.22, you must not lie with a man as with a woman, that is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13, if a man lies with a woman, both commit an abomination, they should be put to death. It amazes me that so many of us who are gay are still alive and we don't have any bruises on our body at the moment. This is a selective culling of scripture which finds this a reason for contemporary condemnation. 
when many other things in the so-called holiness code have long been seen as inapplicable, including having sex with a woman during menstruation, failing to distinguish between clean and unclean animals, indulging in the occult, failing to stand up when an elderly man like myself enters the room, or putting an obstacle in the path of blind people, which would make the Council of Liverpool and the Council of Glasgow very guilty because there are traffic cones all over your city and mine. If you look into Deuteronomy, which also has a holiness code, you'll find that if a man rapes a girl in the countryside, he should be put to death. But if the rape happens in an urban area, both should be put to death, she on the basis that she couldn't have screamed loud enough for anyone to interfere. Now, why are such ordinances in the same book as the thing about lying with a man as with a woman, why are these ordinances not the subject of church debates and discussion and persecution? Because they all come from the same place in Holy Scripture. When people say we should just eradicate these things and forget about them, cut Leviticus and Deuteronomy out of the Bible, I want to say no. I always want them to be there because they show where we once were and are no longer. The Bible is an, a, rec a record of human understanding of God in process. There is no one point at which we know everything about God and there's no one point at which we know everything about God's will. We're in process. And fulfilment does not come from Leviticus or Deuteronomy, it comes later. But many people in different parts of the world, particularly through the auspices of the British Empire, have been demonised by these two texts being used to accuse people who had a natural affection for somebody of the same sex. Uganda is a place where gays are persecuted daily. Very difficult place in which to have any kind of minority inclination with regard to sexuality. And that, to some extent, is because it was evangelised by the British. And the British took this very seriously, and they possibly would have seen people of the same sex having an affection for each other, and this is pulled out of the hat and they're condemned. Which is exactly what also happened in India, and I can say this with a bit more conviction. Because you may know or hear on the radio a woman called Mona Siddiqui. She's an Islamic scholar. She now teaches in Edinburgh. And Mona Siddiqui had a student who I met once. We happened just to both be in the BBC at the same time. I never knew this guy before. A remarkable young man who was Islamic. He was a, a devoted Muslim. His father had a grocer's shop in the south side of Glasgow. And when he was a boy, there was an elderly woman who often came to his father's shop who became disabled. And so this boy would um, answer the phone, take the woman's order, make it up and go and deliver it. And she, this old woman of 80 or more, and this young boy of 16, developed a rapport with each other. And when she died, she left a substantial sum of money for this young boy to assure him of the education he deserved. So the Christian leaves money for the Muslim boy, and the Muslim boy, after his first degree, was deemed worthy enough to do a PhD. And the money he was given by the Christian woman helped him to do his PhD. And his PhD is on same-sex relationships in the Muslim world in the 17th and 18th century. And the proof texts for what went on are the reminiscences of Presbyterian pastors who were there as missionaries and found this kind of behaviour highly irregular and preached against it. Hence, in some countries which we evangelised, where the Islamic um, faith is, uh, is prominent, we helped to fever people's minds, or at least our <coughs> missionaries in the past did. We should not emulate the discriminatory behaviour of a society 3,000 years ago, when science, philosophy, ethics and theology have all shed light to move us on. This kind of legislation is time and culture bound. And the proof of it is that Jesus came, when Jesus came, he did not come to endorse the law. He came to fulfill it. Endorsement and fulfillment is something entirely different. Endorsement is saying it's all okay. 
Fulfillment is saying, well, that's what you once thought, but this is what it's really all about. And so he comes, among other things, to allow people to see that the Ten Commandments were never made for human restriction, but for human liberation. Best seen, perhaps, in the Fourth Commandment, which is, which is about the Sabbath, where people are released in the Sabbath day from a bondage to work. And it's not just the people who are the owners of the business who are given their freedom. It's also the people who they employ. It's also their family. It's also the animals in their fields. And by extension, it's also the fields themselves, which should be given a year off every seven years. And because Jesus began to redeem the commandments and to say that their fulfillment was in human liberation and not in human incarceration, people couldn't stand it. And he was seen as a lawbreaker rather than a law fulfiller. He has to say continually, you've heard it said, but now I tell you, to return the law to its liberative and protective intention. Well, fourthly, you know, we've looked at history and poetry and uh, legal um, uh, material, and I want to say just a wee bit about what one might call site-specific correspondence. I don't know if anyone here has ever read someone else's letters, but if you do, I've done it only once when a colleague who I worked with died, and his mother said, would you look after my son's affairs because his brother isn't keen to do it. So I knew this person fairly well, I had been his associate, uh, we worked in the same church, and I had to go through letters which he had sent, or letters which had come from his friends. I didn't understand everything, because I didn't know the relationships, whether they were friendly or whether they were business. And you felt a bit odd poking your nose in somebody else's letters. So we have access to Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, other letters which may or might not have come from Paul. We aren't the recipients of these letters. We're looking at them second hand. And if we can't understand everything which is said, it's perhaps because they weren't meant primarily for people in the 21st century. And maybe if Paul had thought that some of his material would have been seen as binding on people 2,000 years later, he might have been a little more lenient in some places than he appears. And when I think of Paul, I think there's maybe three things which are important. The first is to realise that he was a pedigreed Jew and that to retain his credibility, he had to prove that he knew the Old Testament texts. Otherwise, he would be discredited. But he was a Pharisee and he knew the law and he does this. And sometimes I think there's a kind of naivety in Paul. He doesn't know everything about everybody. He's aware that there may have been sexual abuse in marriage, there may have been sexual abuse with regard to paedophilia. Whether he has ever met or known a loving same-sex couple, we don't know at all. The chances are not. But secondly, he writes to specific situations. Not every fledgling church has the same potentials or difficulties or even the same culture. And people who advise, whether it's organisations or individuals, don't always give the same advice to everyone. There's a kind of selectivity which you use in order to say the appropriate thing to the appropriate place and the appropriate people. So in one letter he commends a female deacon who must have spoken in church, but in other places he seems to chastise women for speaking in church. Now the, the philologists, the experts in language, might claim that not all the epistles that we think were written by Paul were written by Paul. <coughs> but even given that, I think we have to allow for the possibility that, that different situations called out for, for, a, for a different kind of advice. I remember going to uh, Kathmandu in Nepal and being asked to preach in the church, and I was really quite taken aback by the fact that women sat on one side of the church and men sat on the other. And I wanted, I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't do this, I wanted to question them and say, why do you not have men and women sitting next to each other? Because, you know, there is neither male nor female in, in, in Christ and God made men and women equally in God's image. Well, I was unaware of was that Kathmandu is a, a Hindu nation and the Christians were under suspicion both by the Hindus and by the communists. And that to avoid suspicion, 
it was preferable in that place to have people sitting in different sides of the church for public worship and the way in which Hindus do. It wasn't denying the equal imaging of male and female in God's image. It wasn't denying that all are one in Christ. But there was a cultural requirement which allowed that particular thing to happen. But more than that, I don't know that Paul ever knew much about Jesus. And I say this with no disrespect to him at all. But if you go through his letters in comparison with the Gospel, Matthew's Gospel is the great Gospel which deals with this, the stuff of the Sermon on the Mount, the great teaching of Jesus. Paul barely quotes any of that. Mark's Gospel has sometimes two or three healing miracles per chapter. Paul never mentions the healing miracles of Jesus. Luke's Gospel is the Gospel which deals with the great parables, the great feast, the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, and also mentions somewhere in the region of 18 out of the 21 women with whom Jesus has a, a, a relationship. Paul never mentions the women and he never mentions the parables. John's Gospel comes late in time, but it's the Gospel which is, has a whole chapter devoted to the man born blind, a whole chapter devoted to the woman at the well, and it has these sayings which must have been going around about, I am the light of the world, and um, the other I am saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches, I'm the good shepherd. Nothing like that ever comes into Paul's letters. But Paul wasn't a, a gospel writer, he wasn't that kind of evangelist. He was trying to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, he was trying to convince the Gentiles that God was for them, and he was trying to discipline fledgling churches when there was no manual as to how people should behave in public worship or elsewhere. What we cannot do is to give Paul the final word as if, as if Jesus was a kind of people-friendly warm-up act. But real religion was, was what the intellectually sophisticated Paul offered in great measure. So I come finally to Jesus. And I'm not going to say for a moment that Jesus supplies us with a definitive word with regard to sexual behaviour. Other people do that, notably a man called Robert Gagnon, who's a professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh. I mean, I find this really odd stuff. You know, he, he, he seems to see sex everywhere, but in a very negative light. So, if your eyes uh, cause you to stumble, tear them out. According to Gagnon, that's to do with lust. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. That's to do with masturbation. If your foot causes you to stumble, get rid of it. The feet in Hebrew, in Hebrew particular, is sometimes a euphemism for the genitals. I don't go along with that at all. But I don't believe that we can expect Jesus to give the definitive word on sexual behaviour. He doesn't give the definitive word on assisted dying, on compassionate abortion, on organ transplants, on veganism, on piercings or tattoos, all of which are proscribed elsewhere in the Hebrew Scriptures. People who reject binary terminology, who are gender dysphoric or have a minority sexual identity, should not feel that because there's not a precise word for them or their lifestyle from the Lord, the Christian faith has denied them and their authenticity. It's rather that we should not expect from the Bible an endorsement of our opinions on issues which don't feature in the biblical text. But on the other hand, I don't believe that the absence of such endorsement should make us cling to St Augustine's maxim of love God and do what you want. I think we, it's healthier to ponder two realities. The first is that Jesus has a commitment to include and embrace those who are marginalised and are the victims of discrimination. But, and this is an important but, he never automatically presumes that those who are marginalised or discriminated against are inherently sinful. Never. Who does he include and embrace? Poor widows, call girls, sufferers from leprosy, epilepsy, blindness, paralysis and mental illness, disillusioned Pharisees, tax collectors, enemy soldiers, non-Jewish women, especially of Syrian or Samaritan origin. All of these people were marginalised, chastised or avoided. I can identify 35 different individuals in these characters, character, and only in four instances is there any mention of sin. Jesus is not obsessed with sin, but he is committed to liberating people who have been falsely condemned as sinful, deviant or odd. 
He has to deal with the misunderstanding, if it's there at that time, of Psalm 51, the poem in whose language a verification of original sin is suggested. He keeps, as we hear in the Gospel, the company of tax gatherers, prostitutes and sinners. That's the Gospel record. What the Gospel does not say is that every tax collector is a sinner. Two specifically are mentioned, Matthew and Zacchaeus. We know about Zacchaeus, he climbs a tree. We presume that he's a swindler, but there is no proof. He doesn't say, because I have swindled people, I'll pay them back. He says, if, if I have ever taken more money from somebody, then I'll pay them back and, uh, multiple times. And when he declares he'll give away a high proportion of his wealth, it's not been done out of guilt. It's been done out of joy because Jesus has come to his house and Jesus has come into his life and the world has changed. It's not a reaction to, to sin or guilt. It's a reaction to the grace of God. Matthew, we don't know about, but I love, I love asking people to see what Matthew is like. The other day I, I was doing a workshop in, in, in Leek, which is in Staffordshire, and I asked people, what do you think Matthew's like? And everybody said, oh, he's a desperate guy. He's probably between 50 and 60. He's a, he's a, he keeps himself to himself, highly introverted, totally unsociable, guilt-ridden, oh why? He swindled people, and he'll probably live on his own. Uh, he'll never see the light of day if people are in the street. No, no, terrible guy. Nothing of this is, is evident in the Bible whatsoever. There's only one sentence about Matthew, that he was sitting at his tax desk, Jesus came along and said, Matthew, I want you to be my disciple, come and follow me. And he followed him. That's all. That's all. And yet through the Victorian era into the 20th century, we have this picture of this shriveled soul who's guilt-ridden and who's ancient. Well, I have a picture I sometimes show people about Matthew. It's a picture of a 24-year-old Italian hunk who is stripped to the waist and who is having a shower and he's smiling. And I say to the people who've described Matthew as this kind of, you know, person who's just a, a reprobate, could this be Matthew? Could this be Matthew? Could Jesus not have seen a 24-year-old attractive-looking guy who enjoyed having money, who had a diary full of women's addresses, any one of whom would like a night out in the town with Matthew? Could Jesus not have thought, Matthew, I love the way you smile. And I love the way you smell. I've got enough boys that smell of fish, but you smell of apple shape. <laughs> I would love you. I would love you to be my disciple. Why should he know it? You know, it's, he doesn't go around the country picking up all the social outcasts that he can. He wants people who have got dynamism and life and energy and smile in them. The purpose of God in history is to liberate people from what is erroneous in order that they in society might be whole. The God who liberated a nation from slavery, who gave the law its essential purpose, liberated them from idolatry, from overwork, from victimhood, Ten Commandments. The prophets who spoke in God's behalf were unanimous in their desire to liberate people in societies from egocentricity, from rabid nationalism, from consumerism. Jesus, who incarnated the person and purpose of God, was committed to liberating people from sin, yes, but also from pain, from stigmatization, from religious control freaks, from self-loathing, and from non-fulfillment. It is God's will that people move from a partial, constricted existence to wholeness. And it's the vocation of fringe communities, of which Open Table is one, to be part of that divine dynamic. Faith only progresses when there is a creative tension between the centre and the periphery, the establishment and the dissidents, the guardians of orthodoxy and the promoters of dynamic faith, the sin sniffers and the life affirmers, the traditionalists and those who through imagination see what is not yet there. This creative tension is a divine project in which we are all enlisted. It might not encourage everyone to see original sin as great fun, but it might help them to agree that it's marvellous poetry. Thank you.
Tom White here. So, uh, would anyone like to uh, ask any questions or make any comments? Don, thank you very much. Um, Mark Dowd, um, we've exchanged emails a bit over the, the years and it's great to see you for the first time on the flesh. Um, just a quick question, how did we ever get into this mess um, looking at the Genesis story about male and female he created them, that we move from an is to an ought? If I say I had a great strawberry ice cream yesterday afternoon, it doesn't mean you can infer from that that I hate chocolate, butterscotch has got no place in my life, and vanilla is rubbish. It just is a description of the strawberry ice cream. So when God makes male and female, you can't start to, um, concluding from that that everything else in the rich human dynamic is off limits. It's such a basic, simple error of thinking and philosophy. So how have we got into that mess? Yeah, I don't know how we got into that mess, but I do think yesterday when I was uh, preaching here, one of the things which I alluded to was that one of the things which God uh, is very careful about is that there should be no imaging of God. And I think that sometimes mental images are as harmful and as stereotypical as physical images. And almost to ensure that doesn't happen, one of the things that happens all through Scripture is that when God allows for a self-revelation, they're not always the same. So sometimes it's a warrior, sometimes it's a midwife, sometimes it's a nursing mother, sometimes it's something which might be be animal like an eagle or a dove sometimes it's something which is inanimate like a rock or a hiding place and I would much prefer that when we thought of God we didn't think of God in the terms male and female but we saw God as having a panoply a range a kaleidoscope of images and if we stick only to the narrow binary terms we're missing out the bigness of God but, I mean, the other way that, I don't know, I can't speak for centuries of, of use, but I kind of think that as long as men were in charge of religion, a whole lot of things went wrong. I love what you say, and I totally believe in original blessing rather than original sin, but I happened to be reading Romans 5 a few days ago with tonight in mind, and there's all the stuff about sin entering through Adam or you know, in Adam or sin, but in Christ, or, or, or made alive, or something like that. And it kind of just seems to be a very good argument for, you know, the human race being affected, infected, if you like, by that original action of Adam. I just wondered what you think of that. Well, I don't want to get into the business of biblical literalism, but I think that when we read the, the stories at the beginning of Genesis, we're not reading with history, we're reading stories which are parabolic. And they speak to a deep truth. And, and, and not just the Jewish tradition, but other traditions, other uh, tribal religions in North America, the Aboriginals in Australia, all try to deal with how sin came into the world. And the Hebrew tradition is that it came through our first two ancestors called Adam and Eve, who ate something they shouldn't have, became aware of their guilt, and it's been transmitted genetically ever since. I, I, don't, I, 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 I sit very lightly to that. I mean, I think that as an explanation, um, a, a historical explanation, a factual explanation, it's, it's as if, it's the same as Psalm 51, it's as if when we are born, we are born implicitly sinful, and I don't believe that. I do believe that we all have the inherent potential to commit sin. I also believe that by the time we're probably three, any innocence that sin is has long gone. You know, I, I'm not a father, but I've been in plenty of households where there's children between three and nine, and innocence is not something that's abounding when they're about. <laughs> so I think it's, it's, a, it's a primitive attempt, and I say primitive uh, with total respect to that, primitive attempt to try to explain something which is inexplicable, but it's not a statement of genetic fact. Hello, John. Um, the liturgy, the Roman Catholic liturgy for baptism, um, particularly for children, uh, has troubled me for decades. And um, the prayers uh, indicate that 
God looks differently upon a child who is who has been baptized than before they were baptized. This is very demeaning. Is has been my conclusion for quite a while now, and you've reminded me that when I was uh, a teenager, I, I came to, I came to realise as a teenager the, the the original Catholic teaching of that the sacraments reveal physically what we can't see, and so I just knew as a teenager that God loves the babies from conception. And all that is amazing. It's a wonderful celebration of love of God. Thank you for your teaching tonight. And that's the context of original sin, which I abandoned many, many years ago. Thank you, John. And, you know, I, 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 I did a, I was part of a workshop two years ago with Lutherans from Denmark and Episcopalians from Scotland, Roman Catholics from Scotland and Presbyterians. And we all shared each other's baptismal liturgies. And I think that the, that the other three were really quite befuddled, uh, partly because the Roman Catholic liturgy is actually three or four rites that would originally happen over about six months or more, pressed into 20 minutes. And, and, these, and these theological statements are made, which nobody can understand and probably nobody agrees with. But because that was in the Latin Mass a long time ago, it's been translated ever since. And I think... <laughs> You know, I, I, it would be great if, if that could be rethought through. We cannot say that when God looks on the born child, he immediately sees that this child is inherently sinful. Who would want to conceive a child who is inherently sinful? When Jesus allows the children to come to him, he doesn't say, let me forgive you first. He just lets them cuddle him or touch them. He sees in the child the model of adult humanity. But he doesn't see that, that the child is either sinful or sinless. It's not something which obsesses him. You know. We've probably got time for uh, another question or two. Um, in regard to children and sin, we can't get away from David and the child was conceived with bad children. And at the point of circumcision at eight days, a child would become a member of the Jewish community. That child conceived in that act would inherently carry the sin of the act and who they are. But the moment that child dies, David's response is he knows exactly where that child is and who that child is with, which is God. Kids don't, kids arrive in the world, yes, but that child didn't enter into anything that God wouldn't engage with. And we need to celebrate every single life, however people choose to identify and however they choose to be. And if we build a church that doesn't include those people, then we're a complete bunch of kids. <laughs> and we are not part of something God is building. No last statement. No last that? No, absolutely. So shall we all join together in thanking John so much for coming to speak to me?